everyone. I am so delighted to have Tom Mesero with me tonight. Tom Mesero, all of you know, defended Michael Jackson successfully when he was charged with child molestation. He uh, remained a friend of Michael Jackson throughout his life. He's been following the trial, Kathy Jackson's uh, civil case against AEG, which just ended in a, maybe a surprising verdict for some. Maybe some believe it's not so surprising. They predicted it all along. So Tom, Thank you very much for joining us. And I want to ask you first about the verdict. Were you surprised that AEG is found not liable? I'm very surprised. I'm very, very surprised. I thought the real battle was going to be over whether or not AEG hired Conrad Murray. AEG claimed they did not hire him. The plaintiffs claimed they hired him. There was some very compelling evidence that AEG had hired him, including a statement by their chief executive officer that uh, they had hired him. He used the word hire. There were emails that I thought made very clear that AEG assumed the risk of Conrad Murray. And I thought that was where the real battle was going to be. I never dreamed that they would find that Conrad Murray was, uh, was, was competent or fit to do what he did. Uh, and of course, I have the special verdict form in front of me, Beth. Uh, the jury was asked to go question by question, and in the first question, did AEG Live hire Dr. Conrad Murray? Of course, they said yes, uh, and that meant they got to the second question. Second question was, was Dr. Conrad Murray unfit or incompetent to perform the work for which he was hired? Apparently, they answered no, and if they answered no, that was the end of, uh, of the story. So I'm very surprised. You never know what a jury will do particularly in a civil case where the battle is over money or property. It's not like a criminal case where the battle is over whether or not someone should lose their freedom or reputation. But nevertheless, I never thought they would find that uh, Dr. Murray was not uh, incompetent, you know, but apparently they did. Tom, because I was surprised as well. And I, you know, I'm troubled only because I thought that it was very callous, especially that executive Paul Gongaware you just you know quoted or you referred to uh, when he said, remind Conrad Murray, who is paying him, not Michael Jackson. We are basically creating a conflict of interest. Make sure Michael is ready to perform whatever it takes, basically, or you're not getting your money of $150,000 a month. And, and and so I just felt that AEG I mean, should have been responsible even a small percentage. So I had a hard time you know, with, with this. I'm having a hard time with question number two. It was, was Dr. Conrad Murray unfit or incompetent to perform the work for which he was hired? He obviously wasn't hired to give him propofol, and I guess well, that's what they found, right? It was a secret between Michael and Dr. Murray. Well, well, I, again, I don't know what the jurors were thinking. Uh, only they know, and presumably some of them will make some statements at some point. But perhaps uh, they read that to mean, you know, was he... Had he been disciplined? Apparently the answer was no. Was he properly licensed? Apparently the answer was no. Uh, they may have assumed that he'd been the family doctor and had been uh, hired for general purposes. Uh, I have to believe that was their reasoning. Um, uh, from my point of view, this man was completely incompetent to handle a sleep disorder, which Michael Jackson clearly had. And because of that incompetence uh, and because of his incompetent actions, Michael Jackson died. Uh, my thinking was that AEG had hired him and assumed the risk of him uh, as an employee, and that he was obviously very derelict, uh, very incompetent in the way he administered medical treatment to Michael Jackson. And I felt they would hold AEG responsible. But um, uh, you know, I'm just I very surprised. That Michael Jackson's fans, who are probably the most loyal fans in the world, uh, were kind of split, yeah, really great Absolutely. people, uh, were split on, on this. Some of them, and I talked to uh, one of them, uh, who, who said, or we, we texted, that she really believed that AG should not have been held responsible, but not all fans believe that. So is it, I mean, is it wrong for Michael Jackson's loyal fans to give AEG a pass here? You know, this is a free country. People have a right to their opinion. And uh, reasonable minds can differ about many things. Um, perhaps uh, this particular fan or these particular fans you're talking about, maybe they think that other doctors were responsible 
Uh, and clearly, as I understand it, the evidence was that other doctors in Germany first gave him propofol, uh, that other doctors uh, got him addicted to various painkillers. Um, perhaps uh, this person very honestly and reasonably thinks that they're more at fault. Uh, I don't know the answer to that, but from my point of view, AEG assumed the risk of Dr. Murray. Uh, they hired him because they hoped to make a big profit and they should have been held responsible, but that's just my opinion. Apparently the jury disagrees the with me. Question three, had they gotten to it, was um, did AEG Live know or should it have known that Murray was unfit or incompetent? Obviously the jury didn't believe he was unfit or incompetent, but they, AEG Live, did not do a lot of due diligence on Dr. Murray to learn that he was in debt to the tune of half a million to a million dollars. He was about to lose his house. He closed his practice. And, you know, they didn't really know that much about him, right? And they should have. Well, well, well they did send an email that said words to the effect that they had investigated him. And my understanding is that then at, in sworn depositions before the trial, uh, they admitted they had not investigated him. And I thought that would come back to haunt them. But um, uh, again, uh, the jury had to look at this special verdict form. They had to go question by question. And depending on what their conclusion was, they either kept going or it was over. And apparently it was over after they got to the second question. And that's why we had a very short deliberation. Now, one thing I might also add is I was told that there was a physician on the jury. And I suspect that that physician, uh, that physician's opinions probably were very um, held in high regard in the jury room. And maybe that physician said, look, um, when they hired him, he hadn't been disciplined. Uh, he was licensed in three states. Um, uh, he was fit to do the, you know, the, the perform the functions that Michael Jackson wanted him to do. Um, he then acted incompetently and negligently, but he was not unfit at that time. Uh, I have to assume that's what the jury concluded. And maybe that doctor, uh, if there was a doctor in the jury, that's what I've been told by a pretty good source, maybe that doctor had a very strong influence. I okay, just don't so what know. What do you say to people, and I received a lot of comments on Facebook and Twitter from people who uh, responded to my question a couple of days ago, should AEG be at least partially responsible. And a lot of people are like, no. And this is a money-hungry family, and Michael was nothing but a drug addict, and AEG had nothing to do with it. And what do you say to that? I don't think that's a fair conclusion. I think that Michael put his trust in doctors. He always assumed that they knew more than he did about health and medicine and proper practice. Uh, he put his faith and his life in their hands. And many doctors, it appears, betrayed him, the last one being Conrad Murray, whose incompetent actions took his life. There's no question that what Conrad Murray did in his bedroom was completely incompetent, reckless. Uh, it was just uh, beyond the pale. I mean, he, he got this dangerous anesthetic called propofol, uh, which is safe if used properly. It's used every minute of the day in operating rooms around the country. If you have an anesthesiologist who knows what he or she is doing, apparently it's quite safe. If you have heart monitoring equipment, the proper breathing equipment, the, pro the proper additional equipment if something goes wrong, apparently it's quite safe. He did not have training in the use of propofol. He didn't have any of this necessary equipment. He didn't have any uh, personnel to assist him who were experienced, and what he did was so downright incompetent, you can't even question it. Uh, but Michael, uh, as Debbie Rowe testified, um, put his trust and his faith in physicians. They were, in his mind, they were highly educated, they were experienced, and they were supposed to know what they were doing. I don't think he ever dreamed that he would be treated the way he was treated. But look, celebrities always seem to have this problem. Elvis Presley was prescribed inordinate amounts of medication that bloated him and I think eventually took his life. Uh, the doctor who treated him, uh, I believe, was acquitted in a criminal trial. I think there was a hung jury and then acquittal, but I was told that he was stripped of his license by the local medical board. Um, Marilyn Monroe was a, was a big celebrity, and from what I understand, was, was given all sorts of medications in, in grossly uh, 
detrimental and dangerous amounts. You know, celebrities always run the risk that doctors, like others, like lawyers, like other people, will almost say or do anything to be around them. And it can take a celebrity's life if a doctor bends the rules just to be with that celebrity. And I think that's what happened with Michael but Jackson. A lot of people, uh, I find, well, I, I think a lot of people don't understand Michael Jackson. Uh, he, you know, had a lot of plastic surgery, so you know, people passed a lot of judgment on him. Uh, even AEG, right? We heard during the trial, called him a freak. People passed judgment, and he's just a drug addict, and almost like he deserved what he got. But and, and that the family should have done more. The Jackson family should have intervened. But is, isn't it true that Michael didn't let his family help him? Well, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, there were some family members who expressed concerns. Um, and exactly how Michael reacted to those concerns, I honestly don't know. I wasn't involved. All I can tell you is, first of all, I really cringe when I hear about these, these negative comments about Michael because Michael was the world's greatest genius in the entertainment arena. He was a singer and a choreographer and a dancer beyond comparison. Uh, Fred Astaire said he was the greatest dancer that he ever saw and Michael never took a dance lesson. His choreography, you can't compare with anybody, the risks he took, the things he imagined, the things he put into practice, his singing. I mean, everything he did in the creative arts was just magnificent and beyond comparison. And for people to take a genius who sees things that we don't see and hears things we don't hear and does things that we can't do and criticize that genius for being eccentric or different, um, I don't find very acceptable. I mean, it's a free society. You can express your opinions. But I just don't like the mean-spirited way he's been treated for years because he was eccentric and different. He was different. He was eccentric. He was the, one of the greatest geniuses in history. And he had every right to be eccentric and different, as far as I'm concerned. He was not a freak. He was a person who had a very unusual upbringing and, in some ways, a difficult one. He was a genius at five years of age. He was signing contracts at five years of age, rehearsing at 3 o'clock in the morning while most children were asleep uh, at five years of age, supporting a family at five and six years of age. And who knows what pressures were put on him that this little child didn't even understand. So he was always haunt haunted by the fact that this type of childhood developed his genius but robbed him of spontaneity and the kinds of things that children uh, should experience in his mind. Um, as far as the plastic surgeries he had goes, he had far fewer plastic surgeries than, than hundreds and thousands of people in Beverly Hills. I mean, people will have multiple plastic surgeries and nobody says a thing about it. Michael has a few plastic surgeries and everybody's jumping all over him. He paid a terrible price for his fame and his genius. He was criticized wherever he went because he was different and people were jealous and people wanted things from him. He was definitely one of the kindest, nicest people I ever met, and I will always think very fondly of Michael Jackson. He was one of the most delightful clients I've ever represented, uh, humble, respectful, always listened. Um, I've never had a nicer client in my life, and you would think someone in his position would have been the most difficult. I've had lesser celebrities come in my office and try to be rude and difficult and demanding and have a sense of entitlement, and this man was the greatest entertainment genius in the world, the, the best known celebrity in the world, and he was one of the kindest and nicest people I ever met. So I really don't like those negative comments that people express, but unfortunately his, his life was, uh, was punctuated with those comments, and in death he's still being attacked Indeed. that way. It's very you sad. Know, I'll just tell my own little uh, story, a little attenuated from, um, from Michael, but I was very close to Dominic Dunn uh, in the last years of his life, and Dominic more than once told me a story about how during O.J. Simpson's murder trial, uh, every weekend he had lunch with Elizabeth Taylor at her house and then brunch with Nancy Reagan. Each one of these women wanted their own audience with somebody who was in the courtroom, and they wanted to ask their own questions and hear it firsthand from Dominic about what was happening in O.J.'s trial. So one weekend when he's at Liz Taylor's house for lunch, Michael came and joined them. So it was the three of them. And he said, oh, Michael, he had nothing but nice things to say about Michael, but Michael came with a gift for Liz Taylor. And he said it was just a lavish box, beautifully wrapped in the, in the lavender 
a, a bow and it was really fancy and a long bow and Dominic was great and so descriptive and telling the story and and she opened it up and it was this sapphire and diamond bracelet this gorgeous gift he had given her I know they were very close but Dominic used to say for lunch he brought this to her for lunch anyway he was a very generous man as well um, and you know, I in, yes, he was. In, in, in the interest of you know transparency, I, I'm a journalist, but I'm allowed now to have opinions. And I, you know, I, I really like his music. I really like Michael Jackson. And I always I always thought he was misunderstood, absolutely misunderstood. So let's talk about Conrad Murray. Um, you know, let's go back in time when you were up in Santa Maria. I remember you and I have known each other for ten years. I remember talking to you before the trial, saying you've got your work cut out for you, picking a jury in the community where he lived. And you know, jurors are supposed to be, you know, a panel of your peers. And like, who are you going to ever find to relate to Michael Jackson? Nobody can relate to Michael Jackson. And you told me you used to go up there and before the trial and kind of hang out in the bars and not drink, but get to know people and and get a feel for the community. And that you wanted to try the case in that community and you weren't afraid of it. And obviously, you, you knew what you were doing. But you know, I, I just want to ask you quickly to answer. Um, you know how. How was it that you were able to get a fair jury that related to Michael Jackson? Well, first of all, um, it wasn't difficult if you understood the community. Uh, when I got into the case, I had never tried a case in Santa Barbara County. And of course, Santa Maria is in northern Santa Barbara County. So I did uh, go up to that community uh, wear my jeans, my leather jacket, go into restaurants and bars alone. And, and yes, I would have a drink or two sometimes, but uh, what I was trying to do was observe the people and if I could uh, get into some conversation with people to find out what they thought of this case and what they thought of Michael Jackson. And what I learned through my own experiences and my research was that the community was a very law-abiding community uh, in many ways, a very conservative community, very blue collar, but very independent minded, uh, very libertarian in my opinion. And the community seemed to have a general attitude that we're good people, we're law abiding citizens, we believe in law and order, but government don't intrude too much into our lives because we're good people and we like to be free and independent. And I got gathered in talking to people, almost all of whom were either white, Caucasian, or Latino, that they didn't have an inherent dislike for Michael Jackson at all. That Michael Jackson was respected, he employed people, he rarely went into town, but when he did, he was thought to be very polite, very respectful of others, very kind-hearted. They knew that Neverland was a place where he brought disabled people, inner-city children, uh, because he had a lot of compassion. Uh, and wanted to see people happy and do well. Uh, he was not disliked. Um, many people were actually proud that he was a member of their community. Now, the, the allegations in the criminal case were horrendous. The allegations that he had molested a child, that he had given a cancer-stricken child alcohol to soften him up for molestation, that he had engaged in a conspiracy to abduct children, falsely imprison a family. These were horrendous allegations. They were very troubling to people, but I got the feeling that they were going to give him uh, a, a real fair trial, that they would allow the defense to present its position, and I had a good feeling. Uh, and you say, how did Michael Jackson get uh, a jury of his peers? Well, you had to explain Michael Jackson. You had to explain that he was someone for everyone, that he was a black man uh, from a prominent black family, who had two white children, one Latino child, who publicly announced that he wanted to adopt children from every continent in the world, Asia, the Middle East, uh, Africa, you name it. Uh, his music was designed to bring all people together, to bring people uh, together in a way where they respected each other and appreciated each other's differences. If you looked at paintings in his house, you would see Michael with two rows of children following him, children from every continent, every religion, every ethnic group, all dressed in their native garb. Uh, it, it, he was the kind of person that wanted to see everyone get along and respect each other. And that could resonate in a courtroom if presented correctly. Uh, when I got in the case, uh, the prior lawyers had, you know, allowed the Nation of Islam to be very prominent with Michael, 
one of the first things I did was, was I did not want the Nation of Islam to be prominent. I did not want black political leaders in the community because I was afraid this would cause, you know, a sense that Michael was disconnected from the community, and he wasn't. And I also felt that this kind of message would not resonate well with a jury that was likely not to have one African American, and indeed the jury did not have a single African American. We had one in the alternate ranks, but uh, he didn't make it to the actual jury. So uh, I think that what you have to do in criminal defense is get to know your client as best you can, uh, find the humane, uh, decent, positive aspects in the client that all people have. And in the case of Michael Jackson, that wasn't hard as far as I was concerned. And you had to focus on those 12 people in the courtroom, uh, as well as the judge, and drown out the media, which was largely negative, largely exploitive. Uh, they were not out for justice. They were out for entertainment, as far as I was concerned. And what they wanted to see was the greatest celebrity uh, reach great heights and then fall and splatter uh, to great depths. And I was determined that was not going to happen. Uh, and that's kind of how well, I approached it. Uh, and job well done. Um, unfortunately, you know, Michael didn't live much longer. What do you, let's, let's talk about Conrad Murray, because I understand he is due to get out soon, like later this month. Right, it's October what third today? Second, third, and he's out. He's going to get out around the twentieth, maybe. Is that what you know? Well, you're not going to hear very many good things about Conrad Murray from me. Uh, well, I think he's the scum of the earth. Uh, I have no well, use for I, Conrad I, I heard, Murray. I heard an interview uh, after the verdict outside the courthouse with his appellate attorney, and uh, she's. You know, really hopeful that he'll get his license back to practice medicine. Should he ever practice medicine? I don't think so. I hope he never gets his license back. I think what he did was absolutely deplorable. Uh, it was what he did was selfish, incompetent, and I think he got what he deserved. He's a convicted felon. Uh, he's been stripped of his medical license, and I, as I understand it, in at least two states. Um, and I hope he doesn't get it back. I mean, I'm someone who's a forgiving person, and I do believe people can redeem themselves. But what I sense in this particular individual is no remorse, no acceptance of responsibility. He appears to blame Michael Jackson for everything that's happened to him. The reality is that Michael Jackson gave him the biggest break of his career. Michael Jackson hired him, um, uh, then went to AEG and asked them to hire him. Uh, as his physician, which the jury today found that uh, they, they did. And it was going to be an enormous salary that he had never seen in his career, as I understand it. He was going to be part of the biggest comeback in the history of the entertainment world. He was going to travel to London with Michael Jackson, be there uh, at these comeback uh, concerts. And he was given an opportunity by Michael Jackson that he could never have dreamed of. And instead of making use of it, the way a competent professional would have, he got carried away, in my opinion, with his girlfriends, with his position, with the money he was going to make, and violated his ethical obligations as a physician. Uh, but he never seems to accept responsibility. He always seems to blame Michael Jackson for his incompetent medical treatment. And I am really not uh, someone that uh, you know, thinks highly of him. You say he got what he deserved. Oh, he's a convicted felon, involuntary manslaughter sentence of two to four years. But there are some who say he deserved to be charged with second degree murder. There's a fine line between what he was convicted of, which is what which was the only charge, and second degree murder. And and I mean the DA could have charged him with second degree murder. So maybe he deserved more than two to four years. Well Beth, I was asked what I thought about a second degree murder charge uh, prior to Conrad Murray's criminal trial. And this was my position. Uh, I know family members and fans wanted him charged with second degree murder and wanted him to face a potential life sentence. Uh, I think the way second degree murder is defined uh, in the California Penal Code, he could have been convicted of that. But the problem with that was, uh, and I know as a criminal defense lawyer, how I often take advantage of cases that are overcharged by prosecutors. Uh, what I often do is if someone, you know, is charged with attempted murder when it should be a battery or a simple assault, I will look at the jury and point out that the prosecutors are abusing their power uh, not to be trusted. Uh, I will attack their credibility. 
And I was afraid that if you charged Conrad Murray with murder, uh, that you might draw some jurors in his favor. You might end up with a hung jury, for example, uh, and generate some sympathy for him. I never thought Conrad Murray ever intended to murder Michael Jackson. I still don't. Uh, it made no sense that he would intend to kill Michael Jackson. This, as I said before, was the biggest opportunity of his career to be part of this comeback, to, to go to London, to be with Michael uh, at all stages of the comeback. And I don't think he intended it. I think he was a bungler and just someone who was selfish and narcissistic and having a great time um, being part of this event and forgot his responsibilities as a physician. And, you know, this negligence, which I think was criminal in nature, caused Michael Jackson's death. Look, he's a... Uh, he lost his medical license. He's gone to county jail, the worst jail in America. Uh, am I glad he's getting out? No, I'm not. Um, but do I think he's been penalized appropriately? I do. Um, you know, he's, anywhere he goes in America, people are going to know who he is. This is the man who caused the death of Michael Jackson, or I should say anywhere in the world for that matter. So, um, you know, until he accepts responsibility and tries to change his behavior and his attitude, uh, I have contempt for him. Um, and when I say he got what he deserved, I think for someone who was a physician, highly educated, um, uh, someone who generated a lot of respect from patients and from people who knew he was associated with, my, associated with Michael Jackson, to a fall on this, this hard, uh, that's quite a blow and quite a fall. So um, I hope when he gets out of jail, he changes his attitude. I hope he admits his responsibility and his negligence. And I hope he starts uh, changing as a human being, but I doubt So what is next in this uh, lawsuit? Is there any next step? I mean, I've, I've heard some legal analysts talking about how there could possibly be an appeal, but if you were to advise them, and I know you're not the attorney, but if you were to advise them, would you say they should take an appeal on this? Well, I, I've, I've spoken to some of the plaintiff's lawyers. I know what they're going to do. They're going to appeal. You have to remember that before it got to trial, the judge threw out certain causes of action that were brought against AEG by Catherine and Michael's children. Causes of action for negligence and wrongful death were thrown out on what they call summary judgment. The judge decided that there was not enough evidence to send them to the jury. And very often, summary judgment rulings are reversed on appeal in civil cases. So I have no doubt that the plaintiff's lawyers, who are very competent lawyers, very, you had excellent lawyers on both sides in this case. I think that they are definitely going to appeal uh, many of the judge's rulings and try and get this back before a jury it's again. It's not over, because if an appellate court reverses, it's another trial. That's correct. And it you think that be. they may, because, you know, I didn't follow the trial. I mean, I wasn't at the trial. So, you know, I don't know what the way I, I, I know cases when I'm sitting in the courtroom um, all, all day long. Um, but do you think there's an actual chance, besides that historically a lot of these um, get reversed? Are you familiar with the, the facts? Well, I, I, was, I wasn't at the trial either, other than the rebuttal. I did go into the courtroom for Brian Panish's outstanding rebuttal argument. Uh, I did not attend the trial because I was on the witness list for the plaintiffs. Uh, I was told that AEG was threatening to bring in evidence that Michael had been charged with molestation. And if they did that, or if they did that to a certain degree, uh, I had to be available to testify that he was acquitted of all these uh, criminal charges. That it was a clean sweep, 14 not guilties, 10 felonies, 4 lesser included misdemeanors. But I wasn't called, so I did not attend the trial. I was not in the courtroom other than the rebuttal argument by the plaintiff's attorney, Brian Panish, uh, who is an outstanding well, now, lawyer. Who, um, who pays Brian Panish? You know, I don't know what the arrangements were. Uh, typically, plaintiff's lawyers like Mr. Panish operate on a contingency. Um, they, um, they only get paid if they recover something for their client. I don't know what the arrangement was. Uh, again, I wasn't one of the lawyers in the case, but that's a very typical arrangement in a case like this. Uh, they're willing to, um, to go forward and undertake the costs uh, and not get paid unless they recover something. So 
I don't know if that was their arrangement. Some of it, sometimes lawyers have a blended arrangement. They're paid at a lower hourly rate than they would normally get, uh, plus a piece of whatever they can collect in the case. I just don't know what the arrangement is. Do you have was. any contact now with Catherine Jackson or the Jacksons? I just spoke to Catherine uh, at the rebuttal arguments last week. I attended the rebuttal argument. I saw her and gave her a hug. And then after it, we went into a private uh, room in the courthouse. Susan Yu was with me, uh, my law firm partner, and who was also my co-counsel in the Michael Jackson criminal trial. And we both had a nice chat with Catherine and her daughter, Ribby. Um, they're wonderful people. And um, uh, I think so highly of both of them. And I wish them the best. I'm sorry for the disappointment they, they, they experienced today. But, you know, life is ups and downs, and uh, they may win on appeal, and this may get tried again. How about Michael's children? Do you know how they're doing? You know, I haven't seen them um, for quite a while myself. Uh, I did do an interview for a film on Michael Jackson approximately a year ago, and I did see them. Um, and after that, uh, Catherine invited me to Children's Hospital where some sketches of Michael were donated and I saw them and they look wonderful. They just, uh, they're just just such beautiful children, so beautifully raised, uh, lovely, lovely people. But I'm not personally in contact with them myself, no. Um, I hear they're doing pretty well. Um, obviously, Paris had a, a, a very sad setback, but apparently she's doing much better is what I'm told. And uh, they're wonderful kids. Uh, losing their father was a terrible blow. He was one of the most wonderful fathers ever to grace the planet. Uh, I watched him interact with his children, and I know how loving and caring and protective he was. Uh, I know they were the light of his life. They were the most important thing in his life. And I really believe that one of the major incentives for him to make a comeback was to make them secure. I think he was doing it largely for his children and his family. Michael was a very generous, giving, loving person. Love penetrated so many aspects of his life, particularly when it came to his, his children, who he just adored. Um, and hopefully they're going to do very well in their lives. Uh, it's, it was such a, must have been such a blow for them to live the protected existence that Michael laid out for them, and suddenly to lose him and be under a microscope everywhere they went. Uh, that could not have been easy at all. And uh, I hope they do very well. They're wonderful kids. And as I said before, talking to Catherine and Rebbe was just wonderful. And, and they're, li they're still living with Catherine, but this must be a couple years from you know, adulthood, right? Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. Uh, again, I, I don't, uh, my understanding is they're doing quite well. Uh, and uh, Catherine is on top of things. And um, uh, Life goes on, and I know today was a bit of a setback, but uh, um, I think they're all going to do very well. Because it was in the red, or he was in the red, Michael, when he passed away, but it's very much in the black now, correct? Well, well listen, when Michael, this came up in the criminal trial. The prosecution was trying to say that Michael Jackson hardly had a dime in his pocket, and they had never valued, properly valued his catalogs, which you know may be worth two billion dollars in total. Uh, they were just looking at his temporary cash flow problem. Uh, the estate, as I understand it, is doing extremely well. Uh, it's being run by Mr. Branca, who has a long history with Michael Jackson. Uh, in fact, he was the lawyer who was involved in purchasing the Beatles catalog. He also was involved in producing a lot of his music and concerts. And my understanding is the estate is extremely profitable. Uh, that the Cirque du Soleil show has been a great success, uh, that his music sales have been very, very good, and that the estate's doing quite well. That's my understanding. Well, you know, I, I think I had a lot more questions for you if this verdict had been quite the opposite. You know, I wanted to talk to you all about money, but um, I think we've covered a lot of the ground here. I, if, if anyone out there has any questions, I'm monitoring questions. I'm looking at the chat on the side, but I have been asking some of the questions that uh, viewers who are watching and participating tonight have asked. Um, but I don't see anything. Yeah. You know, oh, okay. Here's one. They want to know what your next big case is. We love watching you on trial. This is Science Girl. <laughs> well. 
<laughs> well, uh, I have a, always have a number of cases. Uh, I try not to promote uh, clients' problems in the media unless I have no choice. Um, but I've got a number of cases. Uh, Susan, you and I are very busy. We're very blessed. We have a very small firm. We keep it that way. We're select about our clients. I have a number of federal and state cases. I still go down to Alabama and do a pro bono case every year with my dear friend Charles Salvaggio. I've been doing that for almost 15 years. I have my free legal clinic, the Mesero Free Legal Clinic uh, in Los Angeles, where lawyers and law students and college students and activists donate their time uh, two Saturdays a month to help the poor, to give them advice and direction. And uh, I live the life I, I live and uh, now, I feel very blessed. Up the other day, I was visiting my old boss, Robert Morgenthau, who was district attorney in Manhattan for 35 years. And he's 94 years old and he is practicing in a law firm in Midtown Manhattan of counsel, but he is doing a pro bono capital case in Alabama. He is, uh, so he's doing some defense work. He was a career prosecutor, really? but anti uh, death penalty and would never seek death, or never did in the short time uh, New York had a death penalty in the, in the last you know, decade and a half. But anyway, I told him about you, how you do that uh, as well. And he's handling the one case right now, but it's Alabama as well. Anyway. Yeah, I'm hoping to do a well, little bit work on immigrants with him as well. So I want to thank you for uh, joining me tonight, joining all of us. A lot of Michael Jackson fans and others are watching. Now, is there anything else about Michael that you wanted to add? I know we covered a lot of ground. You know, I think I've told you what I feel about him, uh, what a kind, loving, wonderful person he was. He was more than just a client. He was a very generous human being. He always wanted to see people do well. He extended kindness to everybody, disabled people, inner city children with problems, animals, you name it. Uh, a very, very sincere, kind person. I will always speak highly of him uh, and uh, I will continue to do so the rest of my life because that's how I feel. Uh, we lost a, a wonderful person and a great artist when he died uh, prematurely. Um, but uh, he left a lot uh, to be remembered. Uh, he was a great father, a uh, great friend, great humanitarian. And um, I'll defend him always because uh, I feel very strongly about oh, what a I'll great person he was. Appreciate that. And thank you, Beth, yeah, for having so me. We'll really talk it. again soon. Okay. Thanks, Tom. Bye -bye. I hope so. Thank you so much.